it's a very important conference and it's a very important topic. And that's demonstrated by the large number of uh, impressive participants in what the discussion that's just taken place and in the uh, items that are coming um, after me. Uh, as I see it, we are both celebrating and regretting the extent of the part which women have come to play in the world of the law since the passing of the Sex Disqualification Act, uh, Sex Disqualification Removal Act, 1919. Obviously, if you're female, uh, you want a world which is not loaded against women. But though it may not appear to be in your narrow-minded self-interest, even if you're not female, you should be equally keen for such a world. It seems to me that there are undoubtedly four good reasons why it matters if women are underrepresented in any group uh, which has influence or advantages in society. Uh, and there's a further reason which may be a bit more questionable. First, for whatever reason, if women are underrepresented in the top jobs, it means that for some reason or another, the system is denying women the opportunity of promotion or appointment. It's simply unjust that people should have fewer opportunities for influence or advantage uh, because they are women rather than men, and we don't want to live in an unjust society. Secondly, an unrepresentative elite or institution risks losing public confidence. A set of chambers, a firm of solicitors, a bench of judges, which consists almost exclusively of men, uh, may well lack credibility, particularly, but by no means only, with women who are advised by lawyers, represented by lawyers, or are present in court, whether as parties, jurors, witnesses, or simply members of the public. Thirdly, it cannot seriously be suggested that women are less good at the more, inf or more important or influential jobs or roles than men. And if you're ill-advised enough uh, to believe uh, that women are less good at law, try telling that to Brenda Hale. <laughs> if the most important jobs in the professions and the judiciary are not in practice equally open to everybody, uh, then it's statistically inevitable that many of those top jobs simply do not go to the best people, and that reduces quality. Fourthly, unless there is genuine equality of access to the top jobs, women will not feel that they are part of the system as much as men. They will not, to use a modern expression, feel the same degree of ownership of the justice system. Just as society benefits from a properly mixed or diverse uh, legal profession and judiciary, so do members of all groups benefit from being part of the legal profession and the judiciary. And the benefit is not merely for themselves, it's for the public as a whole, for society as a whole. Fifthly, and for me, the jury is out on this point. Diversity of personnel leads to diversity of outlook. And that is very valuable in all walks of life. And even if that's not a valid point, it's a reasonable point which is believed by many people. And it feeds back into the other four reasons. And I think each of these reasons is of particular importance when it comes to the legal profession and the judiciary. The fundamental raison d'etre uh, for the existence of lawyers and judges in our world is the upholding of justice and the rule of law. If we're not fair in our selection and promotion practices, what right do we have to expect it of others? Further, the rule of law is one of the two fundamental pillars of our society, the other being democracy, and it's important for the maintenance of respect for the rule of law that we have a strong and respected legal profession and judiciary. And this means a representative, inclusive, uh, as well as properly qualified profession and judiciary. And given the direct and indirect importance of legal services to the UK economy, it's very much in our commercial interest that we maintain and extend this country's reputation for the excellence of its legal profession uh, and its judiciary. Diversity in the judiciary and in the legal profession helps ensure that the law is and is seen to be attuned to modern society and is respected generally. Social fairness, the rule of law, a healthy economy and a respected legal system are pretty convincing reasons for, promote, for promoting diversity. Now the statistics relating to women in the legal profession and judiciary are now reasonably reliably documented. So far as barristers and solicitors are concerned, as we heard uh, uh, earlier, entry into the two professions is moderately equally divided between men and women. More women are now entering the solicitor's profession, uh, rather more men entering the barrister's profession at the bottom. But at the other end of the profession, the position is very different. 
less than 15% of QCs, and less than 15% of the more senior partners in top firms as solicitors, and you can play around with the figures depending on your definitions, uh, are, are women, less than 15%. As to the judiciary, around 45% of the tribunal judiciary are women, uh, but only 28% of the traditional court-based judges are women. Zeroing in on that last figure, and focusing on what might, one might call the senior judiciary, around 23% of the High Court and Deputy High Court judges are women, and about 23% of the Court of Appeal judges are women. In the Supreme Court, we fare a little worse, although better than we did a few months ago. 17% uh, of the Supreme Court are women, and at the risk of sounding a little defensive, if you concentrate on the nine English and Welsh members of the, court of, uh, of the Supreme Court, it's just over 22%, i.e. <laughs> very similar to the 23% in the High Court and Court of Appeal. On the positive and celebratory side, this represents a marked and accelerating improvement. The 50 years after 1919 undoubtedly saw some progress, but it was very slow. The situation in the profession and the judiciary in 1969 um, looks very dismal to modern eyes. It was unusual to see a woman barrister in court, especially on her feet in a significant civil or criminal case. Many solicitors' firms and barristers' chambers used familiar, if ridiculous, arguments about the difficulty of recruiting women, for instance, uh, the problem of providing separate lavatories. Uh, and there were many chambers which unashamedly simply had a policy of not taking on women. Even when they did, there was overt discrimination in chambers. The senior clerk in the Manchester chambers, uh, which recruited Janet Smith, later a distinguished Court of Appeal judge, would permit women barristers only to appear in the magistrate's court. And when barristers on the Northern Circuit had a formal dinner, Rose Heilbronn, a, a, a successful QC and later a successful High Court judge, was left to dine on her own uh, in, a, in a hotel restaurant. In the senior judiciary in 1969, there was only one High Court judge who was a woman, Elizabeth Lane, who predictably sat in the family division. And the next female High Court judge, Rose Heilbronn, was appointed also to sit in the family division, although she was a very experienced criminal QC. Even in the late 1980s, aspects of the legal, legal profession were openly unreconstructed. A few years ago, my wife was editing a book uh, about uh, Lincoln's Inn, and she asked a librarian to find out when the inn had stopped using application forms geared to men. She discovered that the inn was still using a male-only application form for women applicants as recently as 1987, simply crossing out he and his and putting it she and her instead. Although the proportion of women judges has improved a lot over the past 20 years, the senior judiciary has a long way to go. 23% is scarcely something to boast about. Nevertheless, it would be unfair if I didn't emphasize two points. First, the increase in the number of women in the senior judiciary has increased markedly over the past, 20, uh, over the past 10 years. In 2007, there were two women, I think, out of, a 30, out of 35 Court of Appeal judges, and one woman in the 12 judge Supreme Court. Ten years later, there are nine women in the Court of Appeal and two in the Supreme Court. And a similar sort of marked increase can be seen in the High Court, where 21 out of 97 judges are now women, and only five of them in the family division. This shows how slow progress was until ten years ago, and how it has improved since then. The second point uh, is that recruitment of judges to the High Court has traditionally been almost exclusively from the bar although more recently there have been the occasional solicitor and occasional academic, and now the more than occasional promotion from among the circuit judges and tribunal judges. And of course appointment to the Court of Appeal has almost exclusively been from the High Court, uh, as it has to the Supreme Court. As the best barristers tend to be QCs, although it's fair at once to emphasise that there are a number of outstanding barristers who are not, this suggests that the principal pool from which the Judicial Appointments Commission selects High Court judges is remarkably dominated by male fish, around 85%. Viewed from that perspective, although it's embarrassing to put it this way, having 23% when you only have a pool which has 15% women, having 23% of the senior judiciary being women can be claimed as being something of an achievement. As I say, it's embarrassing to put it that way, but it 
statistically is, is, is a respectable point. That leads to two points. First, the figures demonstrate that, as we all know, there is a very serious problem for women in both branches of the legal profession when it comes to career progression. I suspect there are many occupations where that's a problem, but this doesn't justify refusing to face up to the problem in the legal profession. On the contrary, with its special privileges and duties in connection with the rule of law, the legal profession should be showing the way. Secondly, the fact that there is a, a, a problem that one can identify in the legal profession uh, does not excuse uh, those responsible for selecting senior judges to sit on their hands and to blame the legal profession. The judicial selectors and the judges, and even perhaps former judges, must do all they reasonably can, both to assist and encourage the legal profession to take effective and prompt steps to do all they can to solve the problem and to maintain and improve on the trend of appointing an increasing proportion of women judges. Now, so far as the legal profession is concerned, I cannot speak with recent experience as I can in relation to the judiciary, but certain things are clear. The sharp tapering off of women as one goes up the ladder can no longer be explained away by the old excuse that the sad fact that there are relatively few women at the top simply reflects the intake 20 or 30 years ago. The truth is that large numbers of women were becoming barristers and solicitors in 1990. As Lisa Webley said earlier, uh, the trickle-up phenomenon, uh, which was anticipated and hoped for, has not really happened. The problem for women in the legal profession arises, I think, a lot from the fact that the top law firms and chambers require a virtually 24-7 commitment from their lawyers. Lawyers with family responsibilities uh, and outside, other outside responsibilities cannot always be available and will almost inevitably work fewer hours. Therefore, they may not carry the same heft uh, in places concerned with the bottom line among, uh, above everything as those sad people who have no life but their work. <laughs> and in our society, it's far more common for women to have demanding and important family responsibilities, and dare I say, to have a more sensible or balanced view of life. And it's only right to add uh, that there are quite a few men and women who would be excellent lawyers, but who are put off uh, a legal career by the long hours culture. The 24-7 culture in many solicitor firms is partly an internal process, which has built up over the past few decades. And I think it's partly also attributable to what clients expect from their solicitors, because many clients, for instance, in the banking and financial worlds, have a similar 24-7 culture. And because clients expect solicitors to work 24-7, solicitors and indeed clients expect it of barristers too. I think the development of IT over the past 25 years has cut both ways in this connection. On the one hand, it means that a lawyer cannot get away from work wherever she is, and that reinforces the 24-7 culture. Uh, on the other hand, it, it does mean uh, that it is much easier to have flexible working. Uh, it's much easier to work from home, and in particular to work in the evening, for instance. Another very important aspect, which was discussed um, uh, uh, earlier, uh, is uh, the eradication of conscious bias and the eradication, or at very least the mitigation, of unconscious bias and connected with it uh, the pro-male culture. Uh, when, it comes to both, when it comes to recruitment, allocation of interesting jobs and promotions. Conscious bias unfortunately uh, still lingers uh, and it seems to me unfortunately inconceivable uh, that what we have seen recently uh, going on at Westminster doesn't go on elsewhere as well. Uh, it needs to be stamped out. Unconscious bias and pro-male culture is more insidious. I have no doubt that it plays an important part in almost all our lives. It's a salutary lesson to take the project implicit test devised by Harvard University and based on uh, a research done uh, by Harvard and three other US universities. The judges have, been, uh, have undergone a judicial unconscious bias course, which was valuable and interesting, but a single one-hour course can only scratch the surface. It had its amusing side. The very first exercise set for the group I was on required us each to begin by identifying our own unconscious biases. 
which seemed to me to be something of a contradiction in terms. I said that I found it a little puzzling and asked whether we might rather be better employed uh, in identifying each other's unconscious biases. But more seriously, what is really needed is, of course, a change of culture, a change of habits, as Keith uh, um, uh, uh, Krasny said. It's easy to say and hard to achieve. I cannot accept that it would be difficult to make a substantial improvement for the proportion of senior women lawyers in both branches of the legal profession. I accept that it would be wrong and probably fruitless to seek to undermine the effectiveness of the legal profession by trying to persuade lawyers not to do their best to satisfy their clients. But there must be practical steps, uh, and indeed many have been taken, to accommodate the requirements of an ambitious lawyer, an able lawyer, who also has demands or commitments outside the law, or indeed has a more uh, sensible view of a work-like balance. But it requires commitment imagination, leadership and persistence, uh, and the avoidance of um, backsliding, as it was put, put earlier, uh, from senior lawyers. As in so many areas, people are prepared to say the right thing and almost to believe that having said it, uh, move on, considering that the job has been done. And given that lawyers uh, uh, deal so much in words, this is probably as true of, of, of lawyers as it is of any other group. <coughs> Uh, and indeed, as I think Lisa Webley put it earlier, uh, it is easier to change the macro culture uh, than it is to change the micro culture. It's not a particularly attractive prospect to have to take steps which are not necessarily in the immediate interests of our own particular business or our own particular practice. And it's not uh, pleasant to have to take us out of our, to have to move out of our comfort zone, and indeed it's not pleasant to have to question our own assumptions and approach. Uh, I, 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 and, and as Keith Krasny said, uh, what is right in the long term may be more painful in the short term, and unfortunately, generally, we seem to live in a society uh, where the short term predominates. Nonetheless, for the reasons I have given at the beginning of this talk, I think that all senior members of both branches of the profession must take such steps as they can uh, to improve uh, the number of women at, at the top of the profession. Many have done so, and I congratulate them, and I congratulate and thank Simmons and Simmons uh, for hosting this conference today. Uh, but many leading lawyers on both parts of the profession have done nothing or very little. Uh, at the risk of, of going into too much detail, because this may appear to be rather general, let me give one or two examples. Although the intake of women at the bottom of the legal career ladder is generally pretty good, as was, has men been mentioned, it is rather less good at the bar. Some sets of chambers, most notably those specialising in commercial law and intellectual property law, have found that women were not applying to them. They were put off by seeing how few women there were in the chambers by looking at the website. Many of those chambers have now started visiting universities and law schools with women barristers from the chambers, inviting specifically women students to join a discussion. That's just the sort of proactive stance one would hope for. Established lawyers should go out and encourage women to apply to chambers and firms where they might not otherwise do so. And they should not only take this course, but they should seek to identify and promote models to show, uh, role models to show this is not just a question of words, but it really happens. More generally, of course, mentoring and role models are very valuable in promoting the cause of high achieving women in the legal profession. Let me give up two other examples. First, maternity leave policy. I believe many chambers, and it may be true also of firms of solicitors, make the person responsible for maternity leave, now there has to be such a person, of course, required by law, but make such a person a junior woman who does not carry much clout with senior men. Perhaps there should be two people, one male and one female, in charge of the policy. Secondly, on IT, which I referred to earlier. Uh, to avoid lawyers being worked to a frazzle, there's much to be said for compulsory periods of not using blackberries. I understand that this has been successfully tried by some firms. There are, of course, other angles. The very fact that lawyers depend on their clients means that pressure from clients could prove very effective. 
I believe that in the United States there are companies who are reluctant to instruct firms with few female partners or with other apparent discriminatory practices against women. If that started to happen here, what was the right thing to do it would become aligned with what is the, the short-term self-interested thing to do, always a happy combination. So that's a very general rule, and I'm conscious this is a, a broad generalization. Women are more modest than men. For instance, relying on anecdotal evidence, uh, I've seen how much more diffident women tend to be about applying for, to become a QC or to become a judge. Women are more likely to be put off by self-assessment, having to blow their own trumpets. Too much modesty, too much self-doubt. Lawyers in senior positions should encourage them to go for it, and so should judges. Similarly, women, who, who, uh, women have to believe in their own power. Uh, they should, uh, for instance, be prepared to outface in chambers a senior clerk over things like not taking cases over school holidays. And they must be brave with judges. For instance, if the judge says we'll start at 9.30 tomorrow, but a woman barrister or solicitor cannot be there till 10 o'clock because of the school run, they should say so. And in order to improve things, one cannot simply concentrate on women improving their lot encouraging them and ensuring that preconceptions are, uh, are changed. It's just as necessary to concentrate on the men. Until it becomes entirely unremarkable for men to take an equal share of caring responsibilities, there is little hope of achieving genuine equality of opportunity. We must foster a culture which renders it as acceptable for men to look after the children as it is for women. My wife is here, and I have to say that as I say those words, I feel a complete hypocrite looking back on my career. <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, uh, what can I say other than sorry? Uh, and I would not want to shelter behind the fact that that was a, a different time, because I'm aware that that excuse has been used rather unconvincingly recently. <laughs> But I would say, do as I say, don't do as I do. And my uh, children, my sons and my son-in-law are uh, uh, a salutary example to me. Moving on quickly from that embarrassing <laughs> confession and turning from the legal profession to the judiciary is very much to the credit of the Judicial Appointments Commission who are responsible for appointing first instance judges as well as those with, who are responsible for appointing appellate judges, that the proportion of women has improved significantly in recent years. But we obviously cannot simply leave it to the appointing bodies. Serving judges should go out of their way to encourage women to consider becoming judges. This should be done on a one-to-one -one basis, as well as through a more generalised approach. It's fair to say that some judges do it already, but I've absolutely no doubt that the judiciary generally could do much more just as much as I must admit that although I did do things, in my time I could have done more. Mentoring schemes are always talked about, but they are not used very much. Judicial diversity can also be increased by more appointments of academics uh, and employed lawyers, as well as more promotion to the High Court from the circuit and tribunal benches, which as I've mentioned, uh, have higher, particularly the tribunal benches, uh, a much higher, more satisfactory proportion of women. Indeed, this is already happening. It's interesting to note of the recent 16 appointments to the High Court recently announced, four are promotions from the circuit and tribunal benches. Historically speaking, that's a very high proportion of appointments, which are almost always, as I've mentioned before, uh, directly from the bar. Although one of the main causes uh, for these promotions, the unacceptable recent government handling of judicial pay, may be regrettable, I welcome the development uh, of more promotions, provided it doesn't involve any reduction in the quality of the High Court. And it's right to say that the four appointments in, a, in question, uh, by all accounts, give no worries uh, on this score or indeed any other score. High Court recruitment from lower courts improves the opportunity for increased diversity generally, and in particular general, gender diversity in the High Court, and therefore in, in due court in the appellate courts. And in the long term, promotion from the circuit or tribunals should encourage people who do not want to or cannot work 24-7, or who do not like practice but who want to be judges. They can take up a junior judicial post early with a view to moving up the judicial ladder. 
and also I think that more promotion from the junior judiciary serves to improve the morale of the circuit and tri tribunal judges. Uh, I should add that one of the very good aspects of the common law system that we have in this country is that judges who've been practicing lawyers and have been out in the real world insofar as practicing law involves the real world uh, and we don't have so many career judges. We've always had a late entry judicial uh, uh, career uh, unlike uh, continental Europe. I would fight to keep uh, uh, this late entry judiciary but that doesn't mean we should, we should not also have a career judiciary. The two can exist side by side. And indeed, it would improve the diversity of the judiciary, the senior judiciary, if you had some judges coming from the profession at later age and some coming uh, from promotion uh, from the junior, more junior judges. Uh, the prospect of some sort of formal judicial career coupled with a fast track is well worth considering and it was discussed in the recent justice report produced by a working party chaired by Natalie Leven, Queen's Counsel. Uh, and I, I, I think it, it, it is, uh, myself, not merely well worth considering but well worth taking up provided, as I say, we still maintain uh, a substantial proportion of late entry uh, judges from the professions. Recent legislative changes have also improved the prospects of increasing diversity in the judiciary. There's the tipping or equal merit provision in section 159 of the Equality Act 2010, which can be effective, although some people, in my view unrealistically, think that no two candidates for a job can ever be genuinely equal. Also, the statutory enabling of part-time appointments to the High Court, the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, as well as to the circuit bench and district bench and tribunals, uh, may well provide a nudge in favour of diversity. Despite all these points, we still have a long way to go to achieve better female representation in the senior judiciary. There are some who support a quota system. I'm less firm in my view on this than I was, but I'm still against it. I know, for instance, that from some conversations with serving and potential women judges, uh, they would regard it as patronising and undermining for women, although some other uh, serving and potential uh, women judges would support it. I think it could potentially undermine women, uh, uh, women's prospects as much as help them, uh, and there is an element of unfairness as well, and it could risk undermining uh, the quality of the judiciary. The more moderate proposal of targets may well be a more appropriate course, but I wonder whether targets will morph into quotas, either in practice or in law. But any sensible person wholeheartedly wants more women and indeed more ethnic minorities and many more people from less, less privileged backgrounds in the upper echelons of the legal profession and of the judiciary. And on the negative side, if the threat of quotas helps concentrate hearts and minds on this vital and noble aim, so much the better. On the positive side, we all, whether judges, barristers, solicitors or legal executives, or indeed anyone concerned with the, with the law, have to do our best to listen to any ideas about initiatives and to promote and take action to further the vital and noble aim of establishing a genuinely gender-blind legal profession and genuinely gender-blind judiciary. Thank you very much.